<laughs> Welcome to Main Street Living. I'm Cheryl Nelson. Hey guys, I'm Quincy Carr. And I'm Danielle Alvari. We are getting so close to the holidays. We're getting a little more festive. I pulled out my Christmas tree. Q, I see you did something too. Ooh, check it out. Mm, hold up, I'm about to fall. All right, there we go. <laughs> I got careful. The snow, it's slippery. <laughs> Ladies, y'all have um, you know forced me, and it's still a tag on it. Ladies, y'all have forced me <laughs> to get more and more uh, holiday-ish. So I'm doing my best. Baby steps. Baby steps. Less, less grinchy today. There's my tree as well. Um, I love it. Yeah. You got a bonfire back there, Danielle? A what? A bonfire. That fire mm -hmm. is bigger than last week. Yeah, yeah. I really got the hang of it this week. It's really ripping. Yeah, it's really um, going off a lot of heat, too, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you um, know, like Christmas gifts, um, I mean, not cri well, Christmas time means Christmas gifts, uh, obviously. And um, I know, like, it's hard to remember what your favorite, most memorable Christmas moment is unless yeah. we all have one. Right. Mm. Uh, well, for me, I... I just, I love, I love spending time with my family. So that's what I most look forward to. And, and especially, um, we didn't grow up with a dog, Aww. but I got one when I, when I went to, um, I started in junior college. And so he was just like a little pup. And, um, so when I went away to UCLA and came back my first year, this is a picture from then. And, um, he's just sleepy. I, I woke him up and made him take a picture, <laughs> but, um, yeah, I just think spending time with the family and especially like getting to see my dog who, who can't live with me right now. Ah. Oh no! Your dog is so cute. What's his name? Kingsley. Kingsley. Oh yeah. my goodness! So sweet. I love that picture. And I assume Kingsley is with your parents. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. So, Quincy, now, what about you? I don't know. I'm holding a snowman like it's a child. But when I was a <laughs> child, <laughs> when I was a child, uh, my mother sent me this pic. Uh, I was requesting it the, the other night. I think. Yeah. I oh, cute. Yeah. And I was, oh, clearly that's the 70s. Look at the drapes. Look look at the color. <laughs> Brown carpet, green curtains. Oh, my God. Opening up a, a, a like what is now my favorite dream car, a, a Corvette. So it was like what? a radio control Corvette. So, yeah, that was me. Listen to that. And I think my parents had those same drapes growing up as well uh, in Connecticut, for sure. And guys, so my favorite, I think, was getting Nintendo. I don't have a picture of that. However, I do have a contest for you guys to win. Now, Quincy, Danielle, you're not eligible, but our viewers are. What? And I'm giving away the gift of preparedness. So this gift pack has items to help you prepare for 2021, including a NOAA weather radio, and it's worth over 300 bucks. All you have to do to enter is go to preparewithshare.com. And the contest ends 12 p.m. on December 16th. So nice. let's go for a chance to win. And guys, we've got a fun show, a lot coming up on Main Street Living today. We're going to talk about a cool experience you can gift to a loved one this holiday season. Yes, and we also get to catch up with uh, our friends at the Alpha Project and the San Diego Food Bank. And later, we'll be visiting with an inspired former teacher turned artist. But first, we're going to get a look at the Nutcracker through a child's eyes. Stay with us. Hey, welcome back to Main Street Living. And ladies, this is that time of year, you know, when families would be preparing to get all dressed up and go yeah. out to the theater, right? Oh, I know. And for many of us, our first experience going to the theater to watch ballet was probably the Nutcracker at the holiday time. And joining us today to talk about the tradition of the Nutcracker and its impact on kids is Tara Nay Comito, Director of Education and Outreach for the Nevada Ballet Theater. Welcome to Main Street Living. Hi, I'm so happy to be here. Thanks for being here. So describe your role and your previous experience working with students performing in the Nutcracker and what has been the most meaningful part of this experience for you personally? 
So um, I've been lucky enough to work for Nevada Ballet Theater for 20 years now. I know that sounds crazy. Um, but during that time, I've had many different roles working with the students from being backstage and kind of being um, their handler to helping with rehearsals, the audition process, getting the students ready for the stage. And um, my personal favorite, I help oversee our school matinee series which buses in thousands of Clark County School District students every year to see the Nutcracker at the Smith Center, um, which is a highlight of my year. Definitely. And I mean, it's just so important for kids not only to get to see it, but also get to be a part of it. So what about the kids who participate in it? Because that must be a once in a lifetime experience. What, what do they kind of take away from that? Oh, definitely. I mean, for our young uh, dancers, it's really their very first experience performing in a professional production. Students have, you know, um, the opportunity to do school shows, but this is the first mm -hmm. time really being in a professional show, working with uh, professional dancers, our artistic director, our ballet mistress, professional costumes and scenery and sets. Um, so it's really um, an amazing experience for them and when they leave they sort of take away what it feels like to be a real professional dancer the discipline that it takes to be able to perform two sometimes three shows in a day um, it's really an incredible experience for them educationally um, as well as a part of their ballet training Oh yeah, I mean, that would leave a lasting impact there. And I know it's huge for the community as well. What do they take away from it? So um, like I was talking about with our school matinee series, we bus in you know several thousand students to see it every year. And most of these students would never have the opportunity to see the Nutcracker or even be in the Smith Center. So for them, um, it's an incredible, like life-changing experience. The students talk about it all year long. They look forward to it every year. Um, the whole community um, really gets around it the students that are performing in it, as well as the students that get to come see the production. All right. Oh my gosh. It sounds like so much fun. And I know the Nutcracker Home for the Holidays show episode three focuses a little bit on the kids experience and how they look at the Nutcracker. So tell us about that show. So yes, it's going to be really, really fun. We're calling it um, a kid's eye view. So it's through the eyes of our students. Um, you're actually going to see a couple interviews from some of our students that have been in it more than once. So they've had the opportunity to be in it several times. You're also going to see a glimpse of the school matinee series and see the buses pulling up, the excitement the kids have. Um, I always joke that it's like a rock concert, um, which is different than normal ballet uh, because all of our kids get off the buses and they're screaming and they're so excited to be there. Um, so you're going to see a little bit of behind the scenes, just like you did in the past two episodes, but from um, a kid's perspective. And so I know with this year, everything being so different because of the pandemic, why do you think it's still important to keep the tradition alive? Gosh, you know, I think for our students, this is really um, something that they look forward to every year. And I would hate, you know, as their as their instructor for that to not happen this year. So I think being able to keep that alive, you know, we play the Nutcracker music in classes still and um, getting this experience to be a part of this, I think, you know, is amazing for them. Definitely. And um, where can people find out more information if they want to um, take a look at this uh, whole experience? So um, on our website, nevadaballet.org, you can find out all the information there. All right. Good all right there job. it is right down there. Thank you so much for joining us today, Tara Nay. We really appreciate it. We can't wait to, to see episode three. Thank yes. You. you can also go online again, Nevada Ballet, to see the episodes and schedule. And make sure you check your Cox local programming as well. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, stick with us. Coming up, we're going to talk about the gift of an extreme experience. Welcome back to Main Street Living. Guys, since many of us already have so much stuff, 
sometimes the best holiday gift can actually be an experience. Definitely. I, I would way rather get something that I could go do with someone that I love. And uh, luckily, if you are looking for the ultimate gift for any vehicle car enthusiast in your life, we are going to get to talk to someone today who has the perfect thing for you. So please welcome to Main Street Living, uh, Joe Moore. Joe from Extreme Experience. Uh, Joe, tell us what is Extreme Experience and how did you guys come up with it? Extreme Experience is the nation's largest provider of exotic car driving experiences. We allow anybody and everybody the opportunity to get behind the wheel of real exotic cars like Lamborghinis and Ferraris on racetracks all across the United States. Uh, and we started about uh, we started in 2012, about eight years ago, uh, with the idea. And since then, we've just been growing and growing. Wow. Now, now this will be a crazy question because you just mentioned Lamborghinis, <laughs> you know, <laughs> fast cars. You know, but why does this extreme experience make a perfect gift? Why on a Lamborghini? <laughs> <laughs> Well, the, first and foremost, everybody loves it. It doesn't matter if you're a car enthusiast, adrenaline junkie, uh, you might have seen some fancy cars in a, in a movie before and thought, man, what, that would be pretty cool to drive one. Um, so everybody who does the experience gets out with the expression, like just like, that was awesome, they're screaming. And so anybody uh, that's got a lead foot or whatever, anyone's gonna love this. It's kind of like akin to skydiving or something like that. It's a once in a lifetime opportunity to drive a car that costs as much as a house. Yes. And so, uh, <laughs> Yeah. Okay, that's really, really cool. And are there different options or experiences available? And I assume with COVID, everything is safe. Yeah, exactly. So we have, uh, we, we actually travel like a tour to racetracks all across the United States. So from coast to coast, north to south, about 35 different cities, all sorts of different racetracks that you can drive on and uh, nine different models of cars. So whether you're into Italian cars, German cars, uh, you know, what it doesn't matter. We've got American muscle cars. So, um, yeah, and so the experience, you, you go out on the racetrack, you drive a few laps, you get a pro instructor in the right seat to help you out. Um, our whole facility and everything is spread out to encourage social distancing at a, uh, you know, massive, uh, you know, thousand acre racetrack, so lots of space. And then, of course, we have different uh, social distancing lines and signage and everybody's wearing masks and the cars are disinfected between every experience. Um, so the instructor in the car is wearing a mask as well. Everybody's masked up. Uh, windows down. So the whole thing is really safe. It's basically an outdoor activity. You just happen to be behind the wheel of a Ferrari Lamborghini. You got to come to Virginia. I want to do this in person. Just saying. <laughs> we'll be there. Oh, the Dominion Raceway near Richmond. Stop it. Okay. We need to talk. All right. <laughs> we'll get you behind the wheel for sure. So you, I mean, you mentioned you guys travel across the country. What specific areas are you guys available um, for extreme experience? Uh, I'll just name out a few cities because they're really all between. So centrally, we're Chicago, Indianapolis, St. Louis. Out in the west, we've got Seattle, Portland, Phoenix. Over on the wow. other side, we've got down in Miami and up to New York City. And uh, really, I mean, every major market in between pretty much that has a racetrack. Wow. Yeah. So, so Joe, you mentioned earlier about, you know, these cars are driving the experience of driving something that's the cost of a house. What price range are we talking about here for this gift? Uh, the experiences start as low as $199 or $69 to do a ride along. Mm -hmm. uh, and it goes up to, we have packages where you can go up to drive every single car on the racetrack in one day. And that goes up to $2,500. But um, the good news is that we're running 25% off right now for the holidays. So you can actually get behind the wheel of a car for as low as 149 bucks right now and uh, get on track for like 40 something dollars uh, in a ride along experience. Ooh. Wow. All right. Wow. Now here's my question about this because I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, a lot of these sports cars are manual transmission. I cannot drive a stick shift, so what happens there? Yeah, so actually, funny enough, all these cars nowadays come with uh, automatic transmissions, so you don't need to have to be able to drive a, a manual transmission. If you'd like to select your gears, you can use uh, paddle shifters on the steering wheel. Right. But otherwise, they've got very, very smart computers that will select the gear and it'll shift instantaneous, and, and so you don't have to worry about that at all. Thank goodness, it'd be horrible if I broke a Lamborghini. <laughs> I'm just, I'm yeah, worried be... about Cheryl driving a Lamborghini for sure. <laughs> yeah, Cheryl, Cheryl has a car where she's put over 300,000 miles on it. So I would be worried too, Cheryl. No, I, that means I'm a good driver if I have 300. Going from that miles. to one of these cars, Cheryl, please. Oh, no, um, fabulous. <laughs> so, we take drivers uh, at all skill levels from complete novices, our pro instructors okay. at our classroom session beforehand will really help you uh, shake the nerves off and teach what you're doing. So we can take, it doesn't matter if you've won the, you know, uh, Le Mans before or you've never done this, we can, we can accommodate anybody in between. 
I got this. Yeah, we sure. certainly appreciate you stopping by, Joe. Uh, and where can people go find you guys? In fact, it's right there on the screen. <laughs> yeah, head to extremeexperience.com or Google us. And you'll find, uh, you can find a bunch of videos about the whole experience. The website uh, has all the information you need to find a location and, uh, and find our holiday discount as well. Oh, awesome. wow. Thank you so, so much. I'm going to find you in Richmond. We're setting this up. All right, let's do it. Cheryl, wear your seatbelt. I will. <laughs> wow. Well, what a great time to experience new things, right, ladies? So don't lose your excitement because after the break, we're headed to the Cornhusker State for something you don't want to miss. So I promise, stay right there. I hope it's corn. Ooh. <laughs> Welcome back to Main Street Living. Now, uh, Quincy, uh, in the end of that last segment, you mentioned something about corn huskers. What do you got? <laughs> well, Danielle <laughs> and Cheryl, if you're looking for some fun and educational um, and an educational outing for the family this winter, the Strategic Air Command and Aerospace Museum in Nebraska is a great choice. OK, in fact, whether you're interested in the aerospace technology or the uh, uh, history of the military, you'll discover there's plenty of both right there in this unique museum. Let's check them out. The Strategic Air Command and Aerospace Museum, its primary mission is to preserve the history of the Strategic Air Command and its legacy, and to preserve the aircraft and the artifacts that are part of the collection here. When a visitor enters the Strategic Air Command and Aerospace Museum, they are immediately met with the SR-71, an aircraft who today its top speed is still classified. It is enigmatic as an artifact and what it represents as far as the development of surveillance technology, which is really what the SR-71 is. Developed in the 50s, deployed in the 60s, that is one of the most popular artifacts that we have in the museum. We have some of the most unique opportunities here. For example, the B-36 is one of four that are left in the country. Sitting right next to it is the uh, XF-85, which is one of two that are in existence. We have aircraft that can't otherwise be seen. Our RB-45C is the only one left in the entire world. And so, People look at these objects and relate them to American history, and American military history, and heritage, and what they represent. I think that some of the more popular exhibits that we have and artifacts are related to Nebraska's own astronaut, Clay Anderson. So Clayton Anderson has been generous and donated a number of materials to the museum and has given us a really close relationship with NASA. The high pressure exhibit focuses on the Korean War and aviation in the Korean War, uh, where we highlight uh, not just the timeline, but also some of the pop culture of the period and the role aviation played throughout the war. That is a story that needs to be told. Uh, where it fits uh, in the role of aviation, you're making the jump from radial propeller-driven aircraft to jet engines, to fighters and bombers, uh, but also in the bigger world, I guess, of the Cold War. The Cold War accelerated technology and learning and the development of, frankly, new weapons and weapon systems and surveillance systems. So whether it's a missile system or whether it's a satellite system, these were all rapidly growing technologies during the Cold War period that have set us up for who we are and what we are today relative to our global impact. For people who are coming out to the museum, what we're hoping they get from this exhibit is a better understanding of the Korean War, how it played out, but also the individual stories. Because as, as we document the evolution of aviation, the evolution of warfare, the evolution of the Cold War, what is always 
within all of us are the personal stories because all of this is very personal. It's about individuals. The education department has grown over the years. We served 32,250 student contacts in the community. A lot of our contacts are done through the Omaha Public Schools, the largest district in the state of Nebraska with over 50,000 students. Our science, technology, engineering, and math programs do include robotics. We have several activities directly related to robotics, modular robotics with a product called Cubelets, where we take a number of blocks and put them together to create differently functioning instruments. We're teaching kids how to think modularly about how to engage and build the world of the future. We believe that the primary takeaway, the primary educational opportunity that we have at the Strategic Air Command and Aerospace Museum is to teach American military history. That is the first thing we do. The second is the history of Strategic Air Command, what it represented during the 20th century and going forward, what the legacy and history of that is. What fun! <laughs> Quincy, I know where to send you on your next vacation. I think you will really get a kick out of that. And if you at home want to learn more about the Strategic Air Command and Aerospace Museum, and also to find videos, blogs, and other information about kids' camps, go to sacmuseum.org. That's right, Cheryl. That's, uh, that's where you have an awesome sighting, of course. And just like when seeing someone give back, that's an awesome sight. And when we return, we're feeding families in need. So stick around for that. Welcome back to Main Street Living. Uh, Cheryl Quincy, we've been talking a lot about giving back this holiday season, especially uh, those of us who are fortunate to still be working. I know um, we're all really looking for ways that we can give back to people maybe who aren't as fortunate. Yeah, uh, that's true, Danielle. Many families and businesses are looking to give back this time of year. And this holiday season, the need is especially great for basics like food. So uh, here to give us more information and talk about the great opportunities to give back is President and CEO of Jacobs and Cushman San Diego Food Bank, and dare I say the best mustache in the business, Jim Floros. All, all about the stash, man, I would say. <laughs> you wear it well. <laughs> Welcome back, man. Um, how did you and your team respond when the COVID-19 crisis initially began? Well, you know, one of the, uh, I guess, positives in all this is that being a local organization, we it's kind of in our DNA to be adaptive, pivot, overcome. We made the decision to become the regional diaper bank. The bureaucratic decision was like seven seconds. So that was you know, a few years ago. So we saw the problem. We saw what was happening. We pivoted, created a strategy of phase one, of our response. Now we're in phase three, we're already planning phase four, and we just continue to evolve and assess need and make adjustments as we go. Um, you know, we were feeding 350,000 people before the pandemic. Now we're feeding about 600,000. Wow. We've seen a bigger spike in demand with the holidays and mm -hmm. some of the federal programs are starting to run out. So we do anticipate more hardship uh, over the next few months, and we're adapting and finding more innovative ways to uh, make sure people have the food they need. Right. And so how much food does that number of people equate to? I mean, how much have you given out and what are you going to be giving out through the holidays, do you think? So I, I got some new stats just like a day or so ago from my staff. And so just to give you some context, you know, we run out of fiscal year, so that makes it confusing. But just like a, a couple of years ago, we did about 32 million pounds of food in an entire year. So uh, uh, we are projecting by December 31st that we will have distributed 48 million pounds of food. In just wow. That's like nine, 10 months. Yeah, 48 million pounds of food. And then I think I've shared with you before, in a typical year, we spent about a million dollars uh, in food purchases on the wholesale food market. Uh, we just had $10 million Oof. food purchases, 10 times what we normally do. You cannot make this up. This is crazy, crazy times. Wow. And I would be upset if we spend $68 over what our budget is in our house. So. <laughs> yeah. Um, what what types of programs uh, uh, does it take to run or what types of new programs and services does it take to run this operation? 
So when you have to really think about it, some people refer to the food bank as like the Costco of nonprofits. So we don't prepare meals. We do bulk food. So we are a supply chain at its very best. So even pre-COVID, 200 distribution sites uh, that we do monthly that we control, network of 500 nonprofits. So we get a lot of food out in the community. And then through these nonprofit partners, that's how we, we do it. So because there's such a, a huge uh, demand, we probably went from 450,000 people in the county to maybe 900,000 that are food insecure. We needed to augment that distribution model. So we created uh, something called super pantries, taking about 35 of our 500 nonprofits and turning them into high volume, high frequency uh, distribution sites, uh, open at least three days a week and push a lot, a lot of food. And then we did capacity grants to help those nonprofits, refrigeration units, pallet jacks, the stuff they needed to handle that. So that's working pretty well. We tripled the size of our mobile pantry for gaps in service. So we felt pretty good about that. But now, you know, we're starting to see kind of create some uh, the, the next phase, as I mentioned, because we do think there are some segments of the population that maybe are reluctant to get help because maybe they're uncomfortable with it. They don't know how to access it. Maybe they're a little embarrassed, which we'd say there's no embarrassment or shame with this. So now we're going to start looking at maybe some specialized uh, distributions uh, targeting certain groups that were more affected by COVID. We're still going to be doing all the stuff we did before, but maybe some special distributions like that. We're planning one uh, on December 18th with all the service uh, industry. All, there's about 80,000 service industry employees that are now out of work. So we're going to do a special distribution just for them. And so we're going to start doing more pockets of uh, special distributions, I think. Okay. Wow. And it's it's great that you're doing that. And I know the face of hunger has changed because of COVID-19. And you're also doing a virtual food drive as well, right? Right. You know, we depend dearly on uh, food donations and uh, they've always been important. But, you know, this holiday food drive is probably more important than ever uh, because, you know, when you're spending $10 million on food purchases, maybe a million dollars, maybe you get 600,000 pounds of food. Uh, we're projecting we're going to do 6 million pounds of food in December. So the food drives are great because uh, the uh, physical food is wonderful uh, because it's cheap, because it's free to us. So we love that. We're doing a big uh, year-end campaign regarding that. But then the virtual food drive for people who are not able to get food to a certain place, they can go online and they can purchase food on our behalf. So they're helping us in that $10 million uh, food uh, uh, purchase. Um, they're helping us pay for that. Well, Jim, I mean, I can tell you, we certainly we certainly commend what you and your organization is doing because it does take a lot of people. And in this case, it takes a village to be able to make sure that you take everyone. Um, as we can see on the screen, this is where people can go to find out more about San Diego Food Bank at uh, San Diego Food Bank org. So and that thank is great. And then if you take that website and then you at the end, you put a backslash, get help. So for people who need to access food and there's no shame in asking for food, we list all of our distribution sites, all of our distribution partners. People should find something in their neighborhood where they get the food they need. Oh, oh, thank you, man. Wonderful. Yes. Thank you for everything you do. If you don't live in San Diego, be sure to check with your own local food bank in your area as lots well. Of good ones out there. Lots of good ones. All right. Thank you so much. A lot more ahead on Main Street Living. In fact, coming up, it's the season of giving back, as we've been talking about. And our next story will tug at your heartstrings. Don't miss it. Welcome back to Main Street Living, uh, ladies. One thing that I can be completely transparent about is I love seeing good people do good things that mm -hmm. are helpful. So. I know, right? It, it really does tug at the heart there. And work, recovery, and support. That's the mission of the Alpha Project in San Diego. This unique program helps homeless people who are motivated to change their lives and work to achieve self-sufficiency. Let's take a closer look at this organization in action. Step up, just call me, KB. You know, we're coming to your community to clean it up. You know, we're breaking that stereotype of what a homeless person is, this subculture of society. We're just brothers, sisters, mom, dad, grandmas, and grandpas being part of the solution instead of part of the problem. So ladies and gentlemen, left-hand side, don't forget weave in and out of cars. No jaywalking, ladies and gentlemen. So it's a win-win for everybody. You see any cigarette butts, pick up cigarette butts. 
Ain't no race, y'all. The difference between Alpha Project and others is, as I said, we have two elementary schools here, a half a block away from us. We maintain those campuses. We mentor those kids. We make sure that there's uh, no drug dealing, drug use, encampments around their facilities, or anywhere in our neighborhood. We self-police, and that's all a testament to the folks here that used to be out there. Watch out for sharp objects, ladies and gentlemen. Ed's, uh, you know, once again, he's a perfect example of the quality, the caliber of the men and women that have been outside on the streets. Here in San Diego for over 50 years, uh, raised in Chula Vista, went to Benita Vista High School, class of 77, have worked all my life since 1975. But suddenly uh, in 2016, the winter, we had that flu that came through. Over 300 San Diegans died. I apparently was struck with it. And through whatever complications happened, uh, as it turned out, I had a stroke. I was bleeding in my brain and I lost all muscle control. Uh, it's a nightmare. And it just suddenly happens as it can to any American. And it's one of the things you never think will happen to you, but it can. The onus of responsibility uh, need to go to our folks like Ed, people you've seen here that have tremendous skill um, tremendous wisdom and give them the opportunity to shine. It's that peer-to-peer -peer support, talking to the folks out there and bringing folks in here to start the process. Let's go. KB wants us to be safe. He wants it to be fun, if at all possible, but we're also communicating with each other in the field when we're out there, taking care of San Diego, we're cleaning it up. We're also giving solutions to each other, talking to each other about how did you get here? How, where's your family? What do you hope for? Society as a whole and citizens, certainly San Diegans, are so willing to help if they can see positivity, if they can see change, if they can see um, a reward or benefit from that help. Wheels of Change is the perfect example. You know, these are $5 donations, $10 donations to get our people out there and they can see these folks making a difference. They can see the pride that our folks have that are here. Not only clean up the communities, but mentoring peer to peer with the folks they've maybe been camping with for 20 years. On behalf of our project, good job today. For to go do lunch, good job. Appreciate it, ladies and gentlemen. When they come back in from work, it's just, it's phenomenal to see, uh, you know, homeowners came out and say, hey, we're so happy you're here. God bless you. Businesses coming out, bringing waters. And to have these communities come and neighborhoods come and embrace you, say thank you for being here, man, that's a huge paradigm shift. Thank you, Cheryl. You did say we'll pull it our heartstrings. Oh, Quincy, I feel like you need a hug. I just love seeing people helping others and people motivated for change. I think that's a really good story. Yeah, definitely. And uh, if you want to learn more about the Alpha Project or support their efforts, make sure you check out alphaproject.org. Um, we have a lot more great content coming up for you right here on Main Street Living. Next up, we're talking about some more gift giving, this time the gift of art. Stick with us. Welcome back to Main Street Living. Danielle, I know you are really good at art. I've seen some of your work. Oh. Me, not so much, um, but maybe I can really work on that with a little help, right? Uh, definitely. And um, I think everybody um, should explore, you know, especially different areas of art that maybe they might be interested in. And um, our next guest uh, left teaching just about five years ago to pursue mosaic art. And uh, Quincy, I know, also uh, left a job and uh, pursued comedy. And so I think this will especially be an interview that he's interested in. We're going to bring in a mosaic artist, Jen Jamie. Jen, thanks so much for joining Main Street Living. Thank you so much for having me. Hey there. <laughs> So mosaic art, can you tell us a little bit about what that is exactly? Yes, uh, mosaic art is where you purposefully and intentionally place um, and shape little pieces and arrange them onto a substrate, whether it's wood, tile, glass, a table, um, a wall, and you use those little pieces intentionally to create one big whole piece that means something more. Okay, and now, now that's interesting because Jen, you also said that you believe uh, every house, uh, to call it home, needs to hold real art made by real people with a story worth telling. So what exactly is real art to you? Real art to me is something that you just don't pick off of a shelf at a big box store and you don't know who created it and you don't know what that story is behind it. What 
led them to create that art? Um, what does that art mean to you? Does it just look good on a shelf and it, you think it'll look good with the color couch you have? To me, um, it's not as meaningful. It doesn't do as much in your home um, or in your house to make it a home. If you choose an artist, you purchase from the artist, you support that artist, you have a signature from that artist, maybe even a thank you from that um, artist, that's real art. Um, something that you sought for um, and you appreciate more than just something that is um, duplicated across the country on a shelf. Okay, nice. For sure. Yeah, and I mean, that ties right into something that we love to support here on Main Street Living, which is shopping small. And um, this really is something that I can tell is important to you. Uh, you make and sell a do-it-yourself mosaic kit. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Because that would be a perfect gift for this holiday season. It, thank you. Yeah, it is. I love, I didn't realize how much I would love doing this. I think that my experience with teaching lends perfectly into creating these little kits. They look like this. Um, and inside this box is a lesson plan, of course. Um, just some instructions. A little you. tie back to your old teacher days. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And in this kit, I mean, I literally give you every single thing that you need so that you don't have to go on Amazon and purchase all of these things in bulk and spend $150 for something that I'm able to purchase in bulk give you all of these instructions. I even create a video on YouTube for you to follow as well if you need some help. Um, I give you options in terms of you know what shapes you want, how many uh, mosaic glass pieces that you'd like. Um, and I do provide kits from all different um, levels. Like for this one, this is easy. So you don't need a nipper, you do not need um, protective eyewear. So it's perfect for <laughs> all ages, people, yeah, no. building, everything. Yeah, that's that is awesome. And, you know, and I'm getting a little bit thrown off because I see your name is Jen and you remind me. I don't know if anybody ever told you Jennifer Aniston is who you yeah, are. Yeah, I'm getting that. Like. Really? Oh, yeah. yeah. Thank you. I, I do love her. I do. Both ladies of the arts. Yeah, yeah, you know, and uh, you're a former, you're a former English teacher, um, and obviously you mentioned about uh, stuff that you do on YouTube. So, can you elaborate a little bit on that? Yes, um, I am trying. I'm not trying. I am actually teaching mini lessons on YouTube um, right now. There for the beginner level: how to nip and shape glass, how to cut glass, what tools do you need? Um, in in addition, is also uh, ceramics and porcelain. Uh, pieces as well so that you can make different things. So I also have a video on the mosaic kits as well as how to glue and I have a lot more scheduled to go out as well. Um, I do want to continue my teaching with in person. I actually was ready to execute that plan for um, homeschooling children, but COVID hit. So yeah. we'll just table that and come back to that when it's time. We'll sure. mosaic table that. Um, right. How do you come up with some of your? <laughs> how do you come up with your mosaic? You know, inspirations, um, and all, more importantly, where can people find your art and, and purchase it? Um, I come up with the inspiration. I'm I'm a Cali girl. I'm from Santa Monica, California. I love to travel to Hawaii. Anything beach. So, the beach culture, the '90s culture that I grew up in. Um, love it. That in inspires me a lot. That's why I've got, you know, a Kurt Cobain back here. <laughs> Johnny, Ka I mean, I love music and beach. Those kinds of things is what I, what inspires me for my actual art. Um, and you can find it on jenjamie.com, J-E-N-J-A-M-E.com or my Etsy site um, and Instagram. I post a lot on Instagram, Jen Jamie Mosaics. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for what you're doing. And thanks for stopping by and sharing your art and your vision that you have and continue to keep doing what you're doing. Thank you so much, both of you. You're so kind. Thank you. <laughs> no problem. Yep. You have a great holiday. All right. Now, when we come back, we'll, we got a little bit more from Main Street Living. So stick around. Find out. Welcome back to Main Street Living. I still can't believe, oh my gosh, guys, the holidays, they're here. Yes, yeah, getting closer. 
it is getting closer, and 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 y'all are wearing down on me a little bit. So kudos to y'all. I know you got a little uh, Charlie Brown tree there, and just want to <laughs> remind everybody that I am giving away a prize pack worth over three hundred dollars. The gift of preparedness is what I'm calling it, and so you can enter to win on my website, preparewithshare.com. The contest ends at twelve noon Eastern time on December. 16th. Okay. So make sure you go and enter to win that. There's a lot of cool stuff in there. You got the weather radio, some kid, kids books as well. Disaster deck. It tells you what to do during a disaster. And then there's these calm strips. They're really cool too. They're adhesives that you can actually like kind of play around and mess with. They're supposed to help anxiety and kind of calm you down a little bit. So really, stuff. yeah, oh, I need that. I need that in my life. Right. <laughs> I know. I feel like I'm always like doing something with my hands. <laughs> Just like it's like more gifts, uh, it's, you know, especially if you're using your hands to wrap gifts. I'm not a good gift wrapper. I, I was always oh, using. Send new them my way, Quincy. That is oh, my yeah. that is my okay. area. Oh. I'm the gift wrapper. In We're the gonna family. make you do it. Yeah. Because I hate it. I hate it. We've got another I fun show today. Oh, absolutely. Thanks, you guys, for watching. And remember, you can catch us on the go on mobile on our Cox Contour app. And join us for new episodes of Main Street Living Mondays at 9 p.m. local time. So make sure you come back next time and join us as we take a stroll down Main Street. Have a great day. Happy holidays.